And all the people of God say amen, 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 amen. and amen. amen. And as you take your seat, look at your neighbor and just say, neighbor, neighbor. All, hands all hands on deck. On deck. Amen. amen. I want to open this up today by making a statement that I don't believe that the greatest threat to the church is the devil. I believe the greatest threat to the church is what the people of God are not doing. Okay. Uh, General George Patton once said, courage is holding on a minute longer. If you give in to your fears, you are on the path to defeat. If instead you stand strong in spite of your fears, you are on the path to victory. And we must never forget that we are not in the battle alone. With the power of God on our side, we cannot be defeated. Those final 12 words hold the power to unlock every victory that awaits us. The deception of the enemy lies in the fact that Satan uses the illusion of impossibility to deter and to discourage us from advancing forward. For some of us, we can testify today that there were times when we quit too soon. We gave up too early. We walked away prematurely. And we forfeited our possibility hastily. For some of us, the appearance of defeat suffocated our drive to push forward, which therefore led us to believe that victory depended on our personal ability. Satan uses fear to dampen our faith, but this text reminds us today that sometimes God is challenging us to face our situations not with fear, but with courage. There are some battles that you will be undermanned, under-resourced, ill-prepared for, and ill-equipped to handle. And those are the moments that God wants to demonstrate God's power against your enemy. This text encourages us to know that there are some battles that God will require all of us to have our hands on deck. This story is a classic display of faith. Somebody say faith. faith. In those what do we do now moments. See, faith is not always just about having belief. Faith is about putting into action what it is that you say you believe. The text informs us that Judah is now under the threat of enemy attack. The enemies outnumber them. They are outmanned and they are about to be attacked. And this situation produces the reaction of fear within the leader, Jehoshaphat. Now, I know all y'all came to church today, and you want everybody to believe that your faith meter is always on 10. You want everybody to believe that just because you go to church every Sunday and you always live with faith and you never have any fear. And I hate to be the one to tell you today that that is an absolute lie from the devil. Everybody has some fear every now and then. I wish I had about five honest folk today. We have worries, we have concerns, we have apprehensions, and we have some fears. Verse 3 says Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news, and he begged the Lord for guidance. Now listen, he also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. I want you to notice what his initial reaction was to the fear that he now had. It, his initial reaction leads to a string of religious events, if you will, that ultimately culminates in him receiving a divine message from Almighty God. Don't miss that. His fear did not push him away from God, but his fear pushed him towards God. This action builds upon the spiritual presupposition that you find in chapter 15, verse number 2, where it says, The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. 
Amen. See, Jehoshaphat did not try to go solo like some of us do in the face of this monumental, mon monumental obstacle, but he encouraged the people of God to adopt a united front. Here it is. He didn't tell them to unite and go to battle. He, he told them to unite and go to worship. Y'all just missed your holler right there, amen. He, he said, encourage them, let's get together and let's go to worship. Just bump your neighbor and say, that's why we're here today, amen. See, the size of the problem required all the people's involvement because what they faced had implications for future generations. It was not just about what they were going through. It was about what those coming behind them were going to experience. And what they did not do was going to affect those coming behind them in an adverse way. That's why every now and again we need to get beyond ourselves and think about those coming behind us. You ought to bump your neighbor and say, he's preaching already, amen. See, the size of the problem required everybody's involvement. So that's why you see in verse 4, so people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to do one thing, and that was to seek the Lord's help. All the people came together. They met Jerusalem, and they sought the aid of God through something called prayer. <laughs> That's a good spot to remind us today, amen, that some of our situations, some of our problems, some of our difficulties will only be resolved once the people of God all come together in prayer, come together in worship, come together in prayer, come together in study, come together in your giving. Just bump your neighbor and say, let's come together, amen. See, some of y'all can't even say it, amen. See, they sought the aid of God through fasting and through prayer. And this, my beloved, is the secret to reversal. If we're ever going to see God do the impossible in our lives, we're going to have to become united at some point in our worship and begin to seek God collectively through our prayer time. See, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 is about finding God in trust and deliverance. And the issues that they faced were issues that dealt with the promised land as a gift from God. And secondly, the temple as the place where God answers their prayers. He said, see, we believe that when we come in here, this is the one place we do believe that God will answer the prayer. If my people who are called by my name. Y'all y'all not talking to me, amen. See, their concern was over the promise of their future and the promise of God answering their prayers in the temple. And somebody listening to me right through here needs to grab a hold of that because when the promise of your future is at stake and the promise of God answering your prayers are in jeopardy, you will find yourself doing whatever it is you need to do to get God's involvement in your life. If God says spin on your head three times, you're going to spin on your head three times. If God says jump up and down nine times, you're going to jump up and down nine times. If that's what it takes for God, y'all not saying nothing to get involved in your life. Look, they were powerless to the situation, but their powerlessness stood in contrast to God's power. And nobody knew that Morgan better than Jehoshaphat. Well, how do you know, preacher? Because in verse 6, Miss Horton, the Bible says, He prayed, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. Listen to what he says. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand up against you. We could stop right there, go on home and have a re wonderful rest of the day. But is there anybody in church today who has come to the place in your own life that you realize can't nobody stand up against my God? He's in a class all by himself. Somebody in here ought to give God your, a thank you praise right there because you have learned that can't nobody be God like God but God. Help me, somebody. See, 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 this, my brothers and sisters, is an affirmation of trust, a looking to God for help. This is an expression of hope and of faith. 
an expression that tells God, listen, we are putting all our eggs in your basket. I wish I had somebody today who's made up in your mind, I'm going to put all my eggs, Miss Weaver, in the basket of Almighty God. Because I know if they're in my basket, I might drop some, I might break some, I might lose some. But if I put them in God's basket, I ain't got to worry about God taking care of them. Because is there anybody here today who can testify, I serve a God who knows how to take care of all my issues. Help me somebody. Look, they gathered together for prayer because they were at the place, here it is, where human despair collided with dependence on God. <laughs> their, their human despair placed them in a vulnerable place, a place where only God could get them out. And somebody walked in church today, and that's your story. The despair of your situation, the size of your problem, the weight of your burden is too much for you to handle. And the only being that you can depend on who is capable of handling it is Almighty God. As a church, we have some obstacles before us. We have some challenges in front of us. We have some demons trying to intimidate us. And the only being that we can depend on capable of handling our situation is Almighty God. I wish you would tap your neighbor and say, he preached to you already, amen. That they were burdened and their situation led them to pray. And whatever happened to the people of God making the commitment to pray? <laughs> Please notice, this was not an individual prayer, but this was a corporate prayer. This was a group prayer. This was a church prayer. This was a call to the church to come together and pray. And look what the Bible says, and they all came. Y'all y'all just missed a holler. They responded to the call for Thursday morning prayer. They responded to the first and fourth Sunday morning prayer prayer invitation. They responded to the call for the first Monday of the month prayer. Y'all thought I forgot, amen. They responded because they still believe that as long as they were with God, God was going to be with them. And I need about five of y'all. I'll make six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. But there's anybody here to believe that I am with God and God is going to still be with me, amen. See, they responded because they still believe that not only does prayer work, but they still believe that there is power in prayer. That's what the old saint said. There is power in prayer. Somebody bump your neighbor and say, I feel something about that happening here today, amen. Is there anybody in church today who still believes that there is power in your prayers? Your prayers will move mountains. Your prayers will upset devils. Your prayers will get God's attention. Your prayers may not change stuff in the meantime, but your prayers will hold you together until you see God change some stuff in your life. Somebody give God a praise right there for the power of your prayer. Good God from Zion. Look, Jehoshaphat and the people gathered in prayer. Listen, and in the midst of their prayer time, guess what happened? God showed up. <laughs> Look, they said, they said, Lord, we don't know what in the world to do. Have you ever found yourself in a spot where your honest, saved confession was, Lord, I don't know what in the world to do. Oh, turn your halo down a little bit. Y'all scare me. Amen. Look, look, look. They were in prayer saying, God, we have no idea what to do. And, and God showed up. Woo! And this is a reminder to us today that resolution will not come from our reticence. Solutions will not come from our silence. And answers will not come from our apathy. Through an unlikely source in the crowd, God issues a word of direction and encouragement to the people of God. In verse 14, the Bible says, the spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. I dare you tap your neighbor and say, could it be you? Could it be you? Yeah. Amen. Could it be you? His name was Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaniah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, a Levite who was a descendant of Asaph. Now, I use the term unlikely because the phrase, the spirit of the Lord came upon, indicates a possession by the Lord, which indicates that Jehaziel was not a regular, normal prophet. 
teach, Reverend Todd. Because in order to be apprehended by the Spirit of God, it says you are not functioning in a normal, regular routine. Y'all not saying that. You're not functioning in a normal, regular spot. He was not functioning regularly as a prophet. But in this particular moment, he got a word from God. And that's why you ought not treat folk crazily, amen. Because you don't know when God might send a word to you through them. They may not look like they got one, may not look like they belong in church, may not look like they know what's going on, but God just might have your word of hope in their mouth. You ought to bump your neighbor and say, is he talking about you? Amen. Look, look, look. Jehaziel, Jehaziel was a Levite. Somebody holler Levite. That meant he was somebody who had some familiarity, Reverend Frank, with how worship went in the temple. He just happened to be a fourth-generation temple singer. Great-granddaddy sang. Granddaddy sang. Daddy sang. And now he sang. Woo! He was somebody who had connections to David's time as king. Listen. And his presence in the temple in this particular moment serves as a reminder of the new era of temple worship that God was about to initiate. I dare you bump your neighbor and say, don't you know God is doing a new thing? <laughs> God was doing a new thing in their midst. And, and this new thing called for new courage and a new commitment. The Lord responds to their prayer. He, don't move, he didn't move mountains. He, he didn't have earthquakes. He, he, he didn't do something magnificent and magnanimous in the midst of their prayer. They didn't feel the ground shake. All they heard was a word from God. And sometimes nothing will calm you down better than hearing a word from the Lord. You ought to tap your neighbor and say, that's my testimony right there. When my soul was in trouble, God spoke a word of peace and everything calmed down. Look, in verses 15 and 17, this, I know y'all like this chapter right here because y'all like this particular verse. This is where y'all thought I was going, amen, but this ain't where I was going. He said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord said. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged by this mighty army. For the battle <laughs> is not yours. But God, I'll say it again real slow. He said, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. For the battle, this battle, this one right here, is not yours. In other words, you, you, there are some battles you ain't got to worry about fighting. Because God's going to take care of them. He said, tomorrow, somebody say tomorrow. March out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your position. Stand still. And watch the Lord's victory. Go on out there. Stand still. Clear your eyes. And just watch. Somebody say watch. Why? He says, he is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow. And here's the good news. For the Lord is with you. Okay, okay. Go back to verse 1. He hears the news that they got enemies all around them about to attack them. He is terrified does not know what in the world they're going to do because they're outmanned, they're outnumbered, they're under-resourced. He has no idea how in the world we're going to make this one come out surviving. We don't know how it's going to happen. But he says, all we know how to do is pray. So y'all come on together and let's pray because that's all we got right now. That's all we got right now. We ain't got no money. We don't have no energy left. All we can do is pray. And they're in the midst of a church prayer meeting. And in the midst of the church prayer meeting at 1214 Victoria Boulevard, there's somebody in the congregation who hears a word from the Lord and says, Hold Jehoshaphat. I may not be functioning as your preacher, 
But I got a word from the Lord for you today. The Lord says, don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. Just go on out there tomorrow because this battle is not one for you to fight. All you got to do is go show up because their prayers had been heard by Almighty God. Look, this is a situation, my beloved, that required all hands on deck. And when you face some situation that require all hands on deck, you must not only seek God through prayer, but then you have to have the courage to walk in what God said walk in, even when it don't make no sense. So, Y'all not talking to me. Courage is the devil's nightmare because the devil understands that if one can put a thousand to flight and two ten thousand, what in the world can a whole congregation do? You ought to bump your neighbor and say, neighbor, I feel something about to happen today. In case you didn't know it, the battle over your life is not is won or lost on the prayer stage. If there is no prayer, there is no power. If there is no prayer, there is no power. But if you have prayer, then you have power. And if you have power, that must mean God is on the scene. I wish you would shake somebody near you and just tell your neighbor, neighbor, out of all the stuff you need to be doing right now, prayer ought to be high on your list. They needed God to become real in their life. And I wonder if anybody walked up in here and you still need God to be real in your situation. The people were encouraged to face their enemy because God was with them. And that may not mean much to somebody, but when you know that God is with you, it gives you the extra layer of assurance. When you know that God is walking with you, it gives you an extra dose of confidence. When you know that God is with you, it helps you internalize the situation that's before you. God being with them, encouraged them because God wanted them to know that this battle don't belong to you. This battle is all on me. And if you don't come out of this one, it's not because of you. It's because of what I could not do. But because I am God who has all power, you ain't got to worry about not coming out. I wish you would grab your neighbor and say, neighbor, this battle is not yours to fight. And there are some battles that all God is saying, put all hands on deck. Commit yourself to prayer huh? and commit yourself to courage. Huh? The obstacle was too great. Huh? The opposition was too numerous. Huh? The power was too much. Huh? But God, after seeing their commitment to God, God committed God's self to them. Huh? After God saw that they were committed to God being with them, God said, I might as well be committed to them. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't want to be in a church where we're not committed to God because I can't live without God on my side. I can't survive without God on my side. I can't make it without God on my side. You ought to shake your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, I need God. I need him in the morning. I need him at night. I need him when it's sunny. I need him when it's cloudy. I need him on Monday. I need him on Tuesday. I need him on Wednesday. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and I shown up need him on Sunday morning. Is there anybody here who can shake your neighbor and say, neighbor, I need God. I need God right now. I need God to move. I need God to shake some stuff. I need God to move some mountains. I need God to fight some devils. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Yeah, he will. Yeah, he will. Yeah, he will. The Bible says that they all got together and they began to pray. I wish you would shake your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't know why you're here, but I need a prayer to get through to heaven. And I need to declare over this house today that our commitment to prayer will always reveal God's commitment to us. If they balked at the idea of prayer, they would have missed God's presence. If they had missed God's presence, they would have missed God's promise. If they had missed God's promise, they would have missed God's power. And I just don't know how you can live your life 
After the power of God, I need his power. I need his power. I need his power. The Bible says they prayed and God's response to their prayer was a promise of divine help. They prayed and God's response was a promise of divine help. Say it again. They prayed and God's promise was a promise of divine help. God instructs them, go on out there tomorrow for the Lord is with you. You won't have to fight. You won't have to lift a finger. You want to know why? Because you did all your work in prayer. You did all your work in prayer. I've heard it said that prayer has a threefold effect. It goes up as worship. It goes out as work. It goes down as warfare. It goes up as worship. Out as work and down as warfare. You want to shake somebody and say the devil don't want you to get on your knees. The devil don't want you to call on your God. The devil don't want you to lift up your head. Oh, ye gates that the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord God, strong and mighty, mighty in battle. Won't he do it? Won't he answer? Won't he come through? Shake somebody and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray because God will answer my prayer. Somebody say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. yeah. Won't he fight your battle? Won't he give you joy? Won't he give you hope? Won't he come through? Hallelujah. God responded to their worship. God responded to their work. And then God got involved in their warfare. And if you ever want God to get involved in your problems, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all of your troubles. He'll hear your faintest cry. And he'll do what? He'll answer you. By and by. There are some problems. Hey! There are some problems that require all hands on deck. Not some, all hands on. The text does not say a few of them came. It don't say some of them showed up. It say all of them came because they all understood the severity of what they were dealing with. Look at your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, we need you to be on deck. Amen. 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 Let me, let me close this the way I opened it. The greatest threat to the church is not what Ron DeSantis is doing. It is not what the government is doing. It is not what politicians are doing. It's not what the devil is doing. The greatest threat to the church is what the people of faith are not doing. That's the greatest threat to the church. Amen. Bow your heads for a moment.